Hola a todos, ¿cómo están? Yo soy Sofía Macías, autora de los libros de Pequeño Cerdo Capitalista y hoy de verdad tenemos una suerte extraordinaria porque estamos desde el décimo encuentro de educación financiera de City Banamex y vamos a hablar con Morgan Housel, el autor de The Psychology of Money y en español se llama ¿Cómo piensan los ricos? Una traducción un poco libre, pero la verdad es que sí te van a llevar sus consejos a ser más rico a lo largo del tiempo y sobre todo pues entender cómo tu mente se puede poner en el camino, tu comportamiento de que tengas una vida más próspera. Entonces, les quiero advertir nada más que esta entrevista va a estar en inglés, pero vamos a tener subtítulos para que lo entiendas perfecto. Y por favor, no te la pierdas porque es una joya. Uh, Morgan, really, thanks a lot. I feel so lucky that we have you in our YouTube channel. Thanks so much for having me, sir. And, um, My first question, it's very basic, but why did you get interested in the psychology of money? Well, I started writing as a financial writer in 2008, which 2008, of course, was the financial crisis, the whole global economy just imploding all around us. And so I wanted to answer the question, what happened in 2008? Just I'm trying to explain what happened. And I realized that you could not figure out what happened and you couldn't explain <laughs> what happened if you were just looking through the lens of finance and economics like a finance textbook or an economics textbook, nothing in there will tell you why people did what they did during the financial crisis. But if you were thinking about it through psychology or sociology or political science or history, all these other fields that had nothing to do with investing perfectly explained what was going on and why people were doing the things that they did. So that just led me to believe that investing was not the study of finance. It was a study of how people behave with money and how people make decisions with their money, which was so much broader than what is taught in an economics textbook. So that's what got me interested in not what should you do with your money, but what happens inside of your head when you try to make decisions with money. And how did that change your decisions in 2008? Because it, it's very funny, the blog of, of Pequeño Cerdo Capitalista, Little Capitalist Pig, which is the name of, of the book, the blog, and the YouTube channel, also started in 2008 and changed a lot my perspective. And yeah. In your book, you say that Uh, in the first chapter, uh, the decisions we're going to take uh, about money have a lot to do with our context, with how we grew. It's not the same uh, generation that grew with high inflation than with low inflation. Our parents do not save because they grew with very, very high inflation. Right. But right now we have been, since 2008 and up to now, uh, we have had many changes. How did the 2008 crisis change you and your decisions? And how do you think that all these different things that have happened in the last 10, 15 years will change the, the decisions or the, the way we, we decide about money in this generation? Well, and that's part of why I love coming to other countries like this is because <laughs> what I've experienced as an American is very different from what you and other people have experienced in Mexico. Or the 2008 the crisis and the COVID impacted everybody. Yeah. But in very different ways. Let's, let's talk about COVID. In America, we had $7 trillion dollars of stimulus in 2020, the most stimulus ever. Yeah, so, it right. so it was just, <laughs> they just put it in a big dump truck and threw it in the street. So in 2020, it was for about two months in America, the worst economic crisis we'd ever had for two months. And after that, it was like the greatest it had ever been because there was so much free money being thrown around. Very different experience if you lived in Europe or Mexico or India or China and other places, everyone experienced it differently. So I think most Americans for COVID economically, their takeaway was, that was great. That was great, that's their takeaway. But it's a very unique experience to America. Other people in the world don't think that. And so everyone has their own little unique experience in the world. And I see this a lot when I travel that the average American has experienced such a different world than the average Australian or the average Canadian, people who we think are like very similar to us. Australia went 25 years with no recessions. No recessions for 25 years, and not a single recession for a whole generation. It changed with COVID. They had a recession during COVID, but an entire generation only knew an economy that went up every single year. Whereas you contrast that with America, over that 25 years, we had four recessions, two of which were really, really bad. And so we viewed it very differently. And so everyone, I think when you come to terms with the different experiences that everyone's have, that You and I might be just as smart as one another, just as informed as one another, but we're going to think about money very differently. And to me, the biggest takeaway from that is the decisions that you make, even if they're different from the decisions I make, aren't necessarily wrong. 
I, like if, if you and I do things differently, we, we would probably don't. We would probably, <laughs> do, we, we, we would probably don't disagree with each other. We just have a different view of the world, maybe different risk tolerance, maybe different time horizon, all of which has been shaped by just the dumb luck of what we've experienced in life. Yeah, actually, that's very funny because we al al always say that personal finance is very personal, uh, so it changes. But we always want very specifics. We want universal laws. Yes. We want things that will work forever. So just um, coming back to the first question, uh, in, in I'm, I'm spoiling a little bit the, the book, but in the ending you say that there's one personal reference that is your parents. Yeah. that have shaped a lot what you think about money. And for example, uh, financial independence is or financial freedom is much more important to you than beating the S&P 500 yes. yeah. um, and whatever. But uh, are there other things that have shaped more regarding to what you have lived with this crisis, working in media that have shaped the way you use money? Well, I think one big thing that a lot of people will relate to this and understand this is Once I had kids, my view of money completely changed because as every parent will know, as soon as you meet your first child, boom, in one second, the world is not about you anymore. It's about the kid, <laughs> everything shifts. So now in the last, you know, my, my kids are four and seven. So now during the last seven years, now kind of the thought process is how can I use money to make my kids' life better? Not my life better, but their life better. How do I make sure I don't spoil them? How do I make sure that they stay hardworking? and they understand the value of a dollar, very, very difficult to do. So that is something that even when I wrote the book, um, when I wrote the book, my kids were, you know, three, and I, and I only had one kid. So I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking about it then. But now I can start to see, now that my kids, oh, I want this toy, I want this, I, want, I can see like how money can influence their lives in good ways and bad. And I think before I was a parent, that was just something that I could not understand or relate to it all. Any hack regarding that? I know that not everything is it's, it's applicable to everyone, but anything that has been good for you to give them the like a sense of money that is that makes them hardworking, but also, uh, I don't know, money savvy, but not too cheap. I, don't I think I think what's really important to understand as parents is that your kids are paying attention to what you are doing, whether you know it or not. You don't have to sit your kids down at the dinner table and say, This is how you save. This is how you spend. Throughout their entire life, they're watching you. And they're watching everything you buy. They're watching everything you save. They know it all. Even if you're not telling them, they're picking it up. Very similar with like your political views. You don't have to sit down and tell your children what you believe. They'll just pick it up subtly over the years from what you're doing. Yeah. So I think about, about that when we're just at the grocery store, when we're buying things, when we're going on vacation, to realize that my kids are paying attention to everything that we're spending. And they're setting their expectations of, oh, this is what you're supposed to buy every week. And that will stick with them forever, just as it stuck with me when I was growing up with my parents. And maybe coherence between what you tell them or, or and what you do is also important because you can tell them, oh, save, and then you just use your credit card for any indulgence and then... Yes, it's <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, great. And um, there's like a trend in Mexico right now that is related to a chapter I absolutely love about the psychology of money that... It's, it's, it's contrary to that, that, that trend. There are a lot of TikTokers, YouTubers, specialists that come out and say, uh, don't worry, don't save, that's, that's kind of stupid. Just make a lot of money and like uh, saving is like for losers. You just need to, <laughs> and it's like, you need, you need to, even you need to spend more in order to push yourself to make more and you'll be wealthy and you'll be rich yeah. in this method. So. Just be an entrepreneur, make a lot of money, or find uh, ways to make more money. Why is this kind of not great advice? I think I think the <laughs> biggest way to summarize why I would dif I disagree with that is because every business, every career is cyclical. Every once every decade, or maybe twice every decade, things are going to fall apart. It's going to get really bad, and your entire lifetime success financially relies on your ability to survive those periods financially. Okay. And so if you are the kind of person who's not saving anything, as soon as the economy is weak and you get laid off or your business is weak, you're done, you're out, game over. If you have a little bit of savings to get you through to the next period, that's how you can compound over the long term to do it. And people are very good at underestimating the amount of agony and problems they're going to face in their personal life and in the broader economy. 
So every single person, me, you, everyone, once or twice a decade at least, is gonna deal with something in our careers, in our family, in the economy. Maybe it's an illness or a death in the family or a divorce, whatever it might be, where there's gonna be a big financial hardship. Everyone will deal with this in their life in different ways, but nobody will escape that. And during that period, it's the same thing. Like your savings is what's gonna get you through to the other side. And so my goal financially is to never get kicked out of the game, so to speak, to never have it say game over. I just wanna keep compounding for the rest of my life. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. If there is a part that I agree with that mindset, it's that money is a tool to give yourself a better life. Yeah. And so if you can use it as a tool to travel, to hang out with your friends, to live a good life, to have some magicals, great, wonderful. But there's gotta be a balance between the two. Yeah, and um, this takes me to another part of your book that says that making money or getting rich is not the same as remaining rich, mm -hmm. as, as keeping this money. Why are those two very different sets of, of skills or abilities? It's just two different kinds of personalities. Like to get rich, you need to be an optimist. Optimistic about yourself, optimistic about the economy, to take a risk, start a business, whatever it might be, that's what you need to get rich. To stay rich, you need like the exact opposite. You need to be a little bit scared and paranoid and you need room for error to get in savings to get you through the other side. So to have both of those personalities at the same time, it's hard because it, those conflict, they're different personalities. But in order to do well for a very long period of time, You need to have the skills to get rich during the boom times, during the good times, and to stay rich during the bad times. There aren't very many people that have those skills in equal parts. Most people are like one or the other. Yeah. And when you hear the TikTokers say, don't save, just become an entrepreneur, get rich. That's the skill to get rich, which is, which is an important skill. Great, like that's a, that's a great part. You, you need to counterbalance that though with the skill of staying rich, which is like the different personality, the barbell personality. Yeah, yeah. It Be an entrepreneur, make money, but save money. Yes, yes. <laughs> not not And I would say too, the best entrepreneurs over time have a conservative financial mentality. They have a lot of cash in the bank. They're scared of debt. And that's, why, and that's why they last. We're that's why they survive yeah. over time. Microsoft, Apple, all these companies, if you actually look at their balance sheet, how they invest their money, they're very conservative. Tons of cash, very little debt. And that's why they've been around for 40 or 50 years. Exactly. So you, you cannot just burn money and think that it's going to be unlimited. Actually, I really like some of the anecdotes that, that are in that, that chapter. Uh, the very, very famous trader, Jesse Livermore. Uh, Jesse Livermore. Yes. Le Jesse Livermore. That he, became, he became very rich, but then he was absolutely broke. He was the best person in the world at getting rich. No one was more talented than get, at getting rich. And he was the worst in the world at staying rich. The, so throughout his life, there were three separate times where he became a billionaire, a billion dollars, and then bankrupt. Happened three times to him. So he was just extremely good at that. And he died by suicide because he was broke. He was the richest man in the world. And he died by suicide with no money. Yeah, that was, and that's, that's why they are very, very different set of skills. Extreme, yeah. He was the extreme example. And talking about investments, uh, why would it be more sensible to start an investment for your kid when he starts, when he's born, than trying to make him a great trader. Well, here's, here's <laughs> how I, I would think about this. All investing returns are return, your annual returns to the power of time. That's, that's, that's what compound interest is. So when your child is young, that exponent, the time that they have in front of them is enormous. And maybe they are, they're not very, they don't have very much money to their name, but they are like time billionaires. They have so much time in front of them. So even a little bit amount that you're going to invest for them when they're young can grow and compound into something enormous when they're older. You have the most leverage with time when you're young with that. And also, and there's another an educational component, which is that the only way to really learn about how investing works and how markets works is to experience it firsthand. You can't just read about it and understand what greed and fear and risk really feels like. Because I call You've got to do it yourself. <laughs> and so if your kid has a little bit of their own money, in a brokerage account in their name, then when they are teenagers or young adults and they experience a 30% decline or a 50% decline, they get it, they see it, they can feel it. And better to learn those lessons when you're young than when you're older and maybe trying to put your kids through college. Are you still a passive investor? Or are For the you most paid? part, yeah, yeah. But you also contribute to a fund, right? You're an advisor on a fund. I, I, I work at a fund that I have some, some money in, but the huge majority of my investments have always been fairly passive. And why those two splits? 
Well, most of what I do at the fund is writing and speaking. I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day management of, of that fund. So my investing, you know, uh, philosophies and ethos has, has always been kind of anchored to passive investing. And you were telling at the, you were saying at the beginning that uh, when, I love the chapter on your personal finance. Uh, you are very frugal, well, related to maybe people that make the same income. And uh, you you save a lot, you invest for the long run, and you prefer passive investments. Yep. Why is that? And you you say you you received a lot of of trolls or hate yeah, <laughs> regarding yeah. that. You should be a trader. They I think think. to me, it's what really matters is not what are the annual returns that I can earn? How do I make those returns really high? To me, what matters is, can I actually survive as an investor for the next 50 years? It's all just about the time horizon and endurance and longevity. And so if I can earn average returns in, an, in a passive fund, but I can do it for an above average period of time, if I can do it for 50 years, the returns will be enormous. And I'll end up beating 90 or 95% of the active fund people by doing nothing. That's the other thing. When it's a passive fund, I can spend all the rest of my time like hanging out with my kids and doing other things that I like. Whereas an active investor is constantly like there's so much input it's that needs to go job. into it. It's another <laughs> job. And so if I can do that with no effort and still be 95% of them over time, that's a great bet for me. And here I have a very basic question. One of my last questions <laughs> at this people usually ask me, which are the best um, investment vehicles? to get compound interest because they think of compounding only regarding to debt or to specific investments. What, why sh what should they know about compounding? Well, I mean, you know, it's different for every, for every country. So like what vehicles in, in Mexico, that's not something that I would have. That's, that's, no, that's no, pretty- no, 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 I mean, um, yeah, but in general, if you invest for the long run, yeah. you will be compounding. If, yes, if I mean, anything, stocks, anything that gives you a return and that you reinvest that return is going to compound over is going to compound over time. So even if it's just the bank account that's paying interest, that will compound over time. Not that much, but even bonds like that will compound over time as well. And so it's just the idea that you're going to get a return on your return and it just keeps growing exponentially over every single year. And well, my last question, you have or maybe previous Celeste <laughs> You have a book coming out yep. in November. Yep. So what happened? The first time I, I wrote the book, I thought I had written everything I needed to write. Right. Because it was a, a 10 book chapter. Did this happen to you? Do you still feel that way? No, I yes. got like 13. No, it goes on forever. <laughs> yes. But uh, uh, why did you decide to, to write a new book? Spoil us a little. Uh, yeah, so the book, spoiler. the book is called Same as Ever. It's about behaviors that never change over time. So just what people have always been doing that they'll always be doing. There's parts of it that are about money and finance investing, but there are parts that are not. It's just, it's much broader than psychology of money was. And so I'd, I've been writing about that topic for a long time. Just what people always do. A lot of it is rooted in my just interest in behavior and how people think, what people have always been doing. And so I just written enough of these essays about things that people have always done and will always do. So I just compiled those into a book that's coming out in November. And who would enjoy this book? Like, what I think anyone who's interested in how the world works, who wakes up curious about why people are doing the things that they do in money, in finance, in health, in politics, in history, all of these patterns that just keep repeating. And if you're trying to answer the question, why do I do the things I do? Why do you do the things you do? Why do other people behave the way that they do? I think this book will provide some answers for you. And very, very last question. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of research on these books. By the way, this is the psychology of, of money in English and in Spanish is Como Piensan Los Ricos. They, they actually just changed the name back for the Spanish version. They're going to call it Psychology of Money. Yeah, and we, are, and we have a, a signed copy for the YouTube channel. So below we are going to write how can you get it. But from, from your book, I mean, from time to time, we, we have to remind ourselves of advice. Which piece of advice do you remind constantly? I think what's most important <laughs> for is the idea that everybody is different. So I, advice that is good for you might not be good for me and vice versa. Everyone's different. So the most important money skill is just being introspective and trying to understand yourself, your own risk tolerance, your own time horizon, your own personality, and building a financial plan based on what works for you, even if it might not work for somebody else. And do you remind that to yourself every time? Is that like the piece of advice that you use for yourself? Yeah, because there are things that I do and my wife do, do you know, that we do with our money that other people would disagree with. And it's not that we disagree with each other. It's just that's your personality. This is our personality. Teach their own. Well, Morgan, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank and you. also thanks a lot, City Banamex, for making this happen. 
And well, please read the book. It's awesome. And there's a lot of advice that I think that will be worth for a lifetime. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.